Hey girls. Uh, so today we're going to continue with gas exchange, but before we do that, I want to ask you guys a question. Um, if I were to draw you a planaria, planaria is like a flatworm, and you guys saw what it looks like. It's got these two little scary eyes. Um, what is the difference between breathing and gas exchange again? So do you remember what the difference is? So this is an alveoli, okay? Okay, so gas exchange is when you have a lot of oxygen on one side and you have very little on the other side. Diffusion says the oxygen will do what? Will go from high to low. And if you have a lot of carbon dioxide on one side and you have very little carbon dioxide on the other side so this this represents a wall some sort of a membrane so which way will the carbon dioxide move into the alveoli or out of it yeah high to low so so this way into it right and this is gas exchange and all things do this okay but what was breathing? Breathing is not this. Breathing is the movement of breathing is the movement of air or fluid by not diffusion, but by what? By pressure, right? So if you generate uh, low pressure in the alveoli, air rushes in or out. In. And if you generate high pressure in the alveoli, air rushes out. The purpose of breathing is to bring in the air and to get rid of stale or old air and bring in fresh air. Because what's in the air? What's it? It's the oxygen. So the breathing for us brings in the air, but then diffusion is what allows the oxygen to get into the bloodstream. So if you're a planaria and you don't breathe, then the only thing you're going to be doing is gas exchange. But it's the same idea. Oxygen goes in because there's a lot more on the outside and there's less on the inside. And carbon dioxide comes out because, again, there's more on the inside and there's less on the outside. Now, some things don't have to breathe because they're small enough that... Diffusion for them is fine. They don't need to move air or water because we talked about it. Things are really tiny. Sometimes they don't need a system to help them. But as things get bigger, they tend to need systems. Yes, Erica. They all exchange gas, but they all don't breathe. Okay? Because yesterday we were talking about the difference in uh, breathing and, uh, and gas exchange. Now, here's the thing. Um, what does the earthworm use to exchange gas with? Yeah, it's skin. What does a fish use? Gills. What do we use? Lungs. Okay. The membrane that we're using to exchange the gas, I want to talk a little bit about that today. Okay. So the membrane we said, oh, why is this so, okay, it's a little bit bigger. The, there are a few things that the membrane has to have for it, or this, or the organism has to have for, uh, gas exchange to be successful. One is it has to be moist. Now, I actually have all of this summarized. Right here. Okay? These are the things that you must have to successfully exchange gas with the environment. Okay? One is it has to have a moist membrane. So that means it has to be wet. If it's not wet, it doesn't work. So an earthworm, its skin has to be wet. For a frog, its skin has to be kept moist because a frog can actually breathe or exchange gas with its, through its skin. We can't do that because if you remember, our skin is what? It's waterproof. Remember? Uh, land animals, some of them develop, evolved uh, waterproof uh, skin. The other thing that the membrane or the system must have is it must have a large surface area. Now, 
That's why the alveoli is bubble in appearance, because we talked about when things are bubbly or folded, it increases the surface area. Um, so, trivia question. What has more surface area, your skin or your lungs? Yeah, it's not even close. Not even close. The surface area of your lungs is like the surface area of a tennis court. So it's way more surface area. Because the more surface area there is, the more space there is for oxygen to get through and carbon dioxide to get out. So alveoli and villi are both folded to increase surface area. All right. Um, they have to have a large surface area. And the membrane also has to be very thin. So for an earthworm, the skin is thin. For a frog, the skin is thin. We don't breathe through our skin, but our alveoli is thin. And here's a picture of that. So here's a cross-section of the alveoli. Look at how thin the wall is of the alveoli. This is the wall of a blood vessel, and this is a red blood cell. This is super thin. Why is it super thin? Why is it super thin? What about diffusion? Yeah, you're right. So what's the objective is to get the oxygen into what? What do we want to get it into? Yeah. And if you if the closer the closer that distance is, the faster it, it gets into your bloodstream. If the membrane was thicker, let's say the membrane is thicker, then it would take longer to go from here to here. The longer it takes to get into your bloodstream, the worse it is for you. Because that means you're getting you're taking too much time to get the oxygen. So the objective is to get the oxygen into your blood as quickly as possible. Because we cannot survive for very long without oxygen. And in diffusion, and you don't need to do this because you're not going to calculate this, but if you double the distance, the time it takes is actually, uh, the relationship is actually, the uh, time is proportional to the distance squared. So if you double the distance, it takes four times longer to get across the membrane. If you triple the distance, it takes nine times longer. So we want to make it as thin as possible. Now, all things have this, but not all things will have um, these. Not all things are going to have blood vessels. Can you give me an example of an organism that will exchange gas, has a moist membrane, has a very thin membrane, but does not have blood vessels. What's that? Plants? Well, we're talking about animals. Yeah. Worms actually do have blood vessels, but uh, I suspect the, probably the planaria does not. The flatworm. Some worms don't. Hydra doesn't. Okay. So they still have to. They still have. Um, they still have a moist membrane. The moist membrane is very thin, uh, and they have a large surface area, but not all things have blood vessels. So why do we need the blood vessels? Yep, it would. Squash a fly, see what you get. You get blood. If you look at this picture of the alveoli, you'll notice that the blood vessels are very close to where the oxygen is. So the oxygen would be in here. The oxygen would fill in this space and you can see the blood vessels are very close why must the blood vessels be close so not only is the membrane thin but the blood vessels are close too because we want to speed up how long it takes to do what to get into the yeah so here's a neat little picture these are all the blood vessels that are in your alveoli the idea is simple make the membrane thin make the blood vessels as close as possible to the oxygen, and it'll get in as fast as possible. Okay, so we want to make the membrane thin. We want to make the blood vessels close, so that the oxygen gets in really, really quickly. And the last thing is, whatever we're using to move around the oxygen. So for us, it would be blood vessels. It has to be able to get to every cell. Every cell in your body has to be uh, fed through blood vessels. Because what do they need? What do all cells in your body need? They need the oxygen and they need the nutrients. 
So your blood vessels, which is our last chapter, is the highway that transports the oxygen that comes in through your uh, gas exchange system, and it transports the nutrients that come in through your digestive system. And these blood vessels have to get everywhere. So your all your cells in your body have to be fed through these blood vessels, otherwise they will starve of nutrients and oxygen. Yep. You said blood vessels are eyes to be different Yeah, so if something does not have blood vessels, that means they're really, really tiny. They don't need them. Here's a cross section of your alveoli. So you can see they're very, very thin. Uh, the blood vessels are, would be in here because, again, you want to get the oxygen from this space into your blood vessels as quickly as possible. So all of this is surface area. You can see, to me, it kind of reminds me of an aero bar. You know how you open up an aero bar and it's like all those bubbles? Kind of like that. So here's a picture of normal lungs. Okay. One thing we'll look at are diseases. Here's someone with emphysema. What's the problem? Not blood vessels. What's missing here? What's the difference in this picture and this picture? A lot of the walls are... Yeah, the walls of the alveoli have deteriorated. So, which represents more surface area? This one or this one? This one. So that's normal lungs, high surface area. Over many years of smoking, what could happen is your alveoli uh, could be damaged. You could lose surface area in your lungs. So what would this person need then for assistance? You might see the odd person carrying one of these around. They carry a, a oxygen mask, right? Tank with a mask. The idea is, even though the lungs have less surface area, maybe if we can give them more oxygen through the mask, it'll compensate for the fact that they don't have enough surface area to bring in uh, to bring in the oxygen. Yeah. No. Uh, as of now, it's not really possible. I, at least I don't think it is. Yesterday we talked about breathing mechanics, so we can we can talk, uh, skip over that. So here is actually. Um, I actually have questions about breathing yesterday. You guys okay with how breathing works? How it's driven by pressure? So this is the big idea about gas exchange. So these are your lungs right up here. This is what we use to exchange gas with. Pressure moves the air in, but diffusion moves the gas, oxygen into your bloodstream and carbon dioxide out. We'll talk about the circulatory system in the last chapter. It's the system that moves everything around. And then you're seeing gas exchange happening over here too. So the idea is pretty simple. Blood goes to your lungs, and I'll show you an animation of this. The blood in your lungs picks up oxygen. It then moves the oxygen to another part of your body, like your brain. Your brain is fed by blood vessels. So then the oxygen would diffuse. The oxygen would diffuse from the blood into that cell or cells that need it, like your brain cells. So the idea is not that hard. But here's the question. What, to be a question actually, what's the name of the molecule that actually transports the oxygen? It's hemoglobin, right? So hemoglobin is the molecule that sits in your uh, blood and picks up this valuable uh, oxygen. Okay? And it's called, actually, uh, when it gets picked up, it's called oxyhemoglobin. You can see that here. So what I want to do today, I want to actually talk to you about something called a dissociation curve. And uh, it's going to involve very, very basic math. If you can add and subtract, it'll be fine. That's all you need to do. There's no multiplication, no division, no square root, nothing. Just addition and subtraction, okay? Just a little bit, a little bit. So this is what's called a dissociation curve, okay? And uh, is that noise distracting you outside? Very much. You guys want to close? No? You guys okay? All right. So this is uh, a graph that shows you how well hemoglobin holds on to oxygen. 
And what you see here on the x-axis is something called the uh, partial pressure of oxygen. Now, this is a measurement of how much oxygen there is. Okay, So you don't really need to know what that stands for. All you need to understand is that as you go from this, when we go to the right, there's more oxygen. So uh, 100 millimeters mercury would represent a lot of oxygen. The way it's the way it's measured is I don't know if you guys know anything about um, the uh, barometric pressure. Sometimes you hear like the weather station talks about the pressure changing. The air generates because the air is a gas, right? And it generates pressure. And what's the most abundant gas in air? That's nitrogen, right? Nitrogen is about 80%. So if you looked at the air pressure of air, 80% of it would be due to nitrogen. 20% is due to oxygen. It's not exactly 80 and 20, okay? So 20% of the pressure due to air is as a result of oxygen. So that's what this means. Okay, that's what partial pressure means. You need to know that. All you need to know is this, that on the left we have very little oxygen, and on the right we have a lot of oxygen. So this is really simple. In the lungs, we have a lot of oxygen. Why? Because what do you do? You breathe, right? You inhale. When you inhale, what comes in? Air. And air has a lot of oxygen. Up here, you could see that on this axis, this represents the saturation of oxygen on hemoglobin. In other words, it's a measurement of how many or how much oxygen is being carried by hemoglobin. The higher the number, that means more oxygen atoms are sitting in the hemoglobin. So if you think of it as a bus, imagine this bus has four seats. Up here, all of the seats are occupied. You can see the number is very close to 100%. So if you were to look at hemoglobin and look for empty seats, you would find hardly any. Anytime you looked at a, a hemoglobin, it should be full of oxygen, which is what you want. Here's the thing. When the blood then moves around your body, and let's say your blood goes to your brain, so let's say the brain is in, a, in an environment of low oxygen. Now, why would your brain be in an environment of low oxygen? Because guess what it uses up? It uses up oxygen, right? So when you use up oxygen, that means there's very little oxygen left. So let's imagine the hemoglobin is at this point. So, it, you know, it travels around your bloodstream and it gets to the brain. And in your brain, the amount of pressure or the amount of oxygen is very low. It says at this point that the hemoglobin can carry about 35% of the oxygen. Up here, it was, I'm going to say, 95%, just to keep the math really simple. What's missing then? So you go to the lungs, you pick up 95% of the oxygen. That blood goes to the brain, and it only holds on to 35% of the oxygen. What's missing? 60%. Guess where that 60% went? To the brain. Which makes sense, because what do you want the hemoglobin to do? You want it to go to the lungs and pick up what? The oxygen. But then you want to go to the brain or the legs or the arms and do what with the oxygen? You want it to drop it off. This dissociation curve allows you to calculate uh, how much oxygen is being dumped off. So, for example, let's say the curve looks like this. And we go to the lungs and we pick up 90 five percent of the oxygen and then we go to the liver and at the liver let's say we ho we have 
25% oxygen left behind, what was dropped off? 70%. So the dissociation curve tells you how much oxygen gets dropped off. All you have to, if you want to know how much is dropped off, it's just a difference between how much it picked up versus how much it would hold on to in that particular part of your body. So if it picks up, let's say, a really quick example, let's say it goes to your lungs and picks up 100%, and then it goes to your left arm, and it only has 20% left behind, what was dropped off? 80%. It's very, is that hard math? No. So if I gave you a graph and I said to you, um, how much is dropped off? Would you be able to calculate it? So let's do one together. So let me show you this graph. Ashley, let me show you this one. So let's say, well, what's our body temperature? What's a uh, typical human? 37. So let's say, let's say this point represents the lungs. And let's say, let's say for argument's sake, this point represents your right femur. Your right femur, your right leg, okay? Um, in that area of your body, okay? How much oxygen was dumped to that part of your body? So what's the value here? What does it look like? 95. So if you want to know how much is dropped off, you have to look at this axis. So this is basically the amount of oxygen in the environment. So the lungs would be the lungs would be somewhere around here, and then your tissues would be somewhere around here. There's way more oxygen in your lungs than there is in your tissues. So let's just say we pick up oxygen in this zone. So what is that? About 99%? It's not quite 100. We'll say it's 99%. And let's say we drop it off and at this point. How much is dropped off? Well, what's this number? What's this number? So what would this be? 50, right? Draw a dotted line across. It's 50. So we pick up 99 and we hold on to 50. What's dropped off? 49. So 49% of the oxygen is dropped off. Does that make sense? Let me show you uh, a curve and see if you can figure out what's going on here, okay? So you notice in this case the curve is shifted. So let's say this point represents the lungs. And let's say Let's say this point represents some tissue. Okay. Um, let's say this tissue is your liver. Okay. So this, this wall here represents the amount of oxygen in your liver. And this represents the amount of oxygen in your lungs. Okay. So first off, how much oxygen is picked up? What is it? I don't know exactly what it is, but I can kind of guess. It looks like it's about what? Maybe 97, 98%. We'll just say 98%, okay? So let's say it's 98%. Now, let's imagine that we're looking at the blue line. So we're looking at this line, okay? What oxygen is dropped off to your liver if you look at that curve? The blue curve. So at, at this amount of oxygen in the environment, we're at this point, right? So this would correspond to what? 50? So how much is dropped off? We 98 minus 50, which is what? 48%. Right? Now let's look at the red line. Look at the red line for a second, okay? Take a look at the red line, and what would the value be for the red line? So it's 98, but then at this point it's, what, 20? So 98 minus 20 is 78. Okay, why is there a difference? I want you to look at 
what's going on in this graph. And you'll notice there's another piece of information. The x-axis is the amount of oxygen. The y-axis is how much the hemoglobin is holding on to the oxygen. The simple uh, uh, subtraction is we use that to figure out how much is dumped. But there's another piece of information on this graph, right? What's the other piece of info? Not mercury. It's, yeah, Serena, what is it? Yeah, it's the amount of carbon dioxide. It's the unit of pressure. It, it's notice it's the same unit as the x-axis, right? Yes, it is. Millimeters mercury. So, this is more carbon dioxide than this one, right? Okay. The blue line represents less carbon dioxide than the red line. Does that make sense? Can you guys see that on the line? Gwen, can you see that? Yeah. You sure? So which one has more carbon dioxide? The purple line or the green one? What? Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you're paying attention. So, what you think is happening here? In which scenario do we drop off more carbon dioxide? Lauren? When there's more what? Did I say drop off more carbon dioxide? Yeah. Sorry. In what scenario do we drop off more oxygen? Thank you. And you can see that when there is less carbon dioxide, we drop off 48%. When there is more carbon dioxide, we drop off 78%. Why? What, why, what's the, what's going on here? Why are we doing that? I want you to think about that for a second. Why did we drop off more oxygen when there's more carbon dioxide? Why would there be more carbon dioxide? What's that? No, but why would there be more carbon dioxide in your body? What would be a scenario where you generate more carbon dioxide? Go back to this very elegant equation at the beginning of this. Energy. When you eat food. <laughs> if there's more of this, that means you need more what? You need more oxygen, right? Why? Because you need more energy. If you're running... Do you need more energy or less energy? Do you need more air or less air? Why do you need more air? Because you need more oxygen. So you're breathing in more because you need more oxygen. So the reason why you have this shift when you have more carbon dioxide, you drop off more oxygen, is because you need it. If there's more carbon dioxide, it's telling you that you need more oxygen because you need more energy. So, in fact, if we looked at like um, how breathing is controlled, so are you okay with the math of the dissociation curve? I mean, I'll do some more examples with you after, and I'll give you some other questions to think about the dissociation curve. Um, but are you okay with the math, like figuring out how much would be dumped? That's pretty easy. What do you think? We can go over that after if you want. In terms of actually uh, chemicals that affect breathing rates, because here's the thing, you can't do anything about the diffusion is a natural process. You can't control that. If you go in an environment where there's very little oxygen, there's nothing you can do, really, to get the oxygen in if there's not enough of it. You can't change the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. What you can change is how you breathe, though. So what you can do is this. If your body detects a lot of CO2, what do you think happens to your breathing rate? Yeah. It would go up. It would increase. What would happen if your oxygen rates are low? Oxygen no, rates are low. If it's speed up. So those are the two main chemicals. If oxygen levels are low or carbon dioxide levels are high, your breathing rate would increase. And it's actually controlled by your brain 
there is a region called the medulla oblongata, which is in the brainstem, and it would basically fire off messages to your diaphragm to control breathing rate. So what would happen in this scenario? You're in a room, ventilation is not great, and there's a lot of people in the room. Sure. What would happen to your breathing rate? Why would it increase? More importantly is there's probably a lot of carbon dioxide in the room because what are you exhaling? They're exhaling carbon dioxide. So as you and actually the carbon dioxide chemical is the primary chemical that stimulates the breathing rate. Uh, oxygen levels are secondary, but they both affect breathing rate. So here's the thing. Uh, why is it that as you climb up a mountain, you have trouble breathing? You got two problems. One is as you go up a mountain. Yes. So as you go up a mountain, the higher you go, I don't know the exact. There's a, I think, it, I think it's a linear relationship. But if you had height and you had pressure, it would do this. The higher you go, the lower the pressure. There comes a point. There comes a point where the pressure is so low outside your body that you cannot generate lower pressure to get air in. Remember the way you breathe, right? The way you breathe is you have to generate low pressure inside to get air in. If you're in an environment where the pressure is lower than you can generate in your body, you ain't breathing. In fact, air is probably going to come out of you. So if you're up high in an airplane and the window's open, you're in big trouble because all the air is going to rush out. You, you, you won't be breathing. If you climb up a mountain, it becomes harder and harder to breathe because there's less pressure, which means the flow of air into your lungs is reduced. But there's also less oxygen, too, in the air. So you've got a double problem. You're having trouble moving the air, but you're also not getting enough oxygen. That's what the masks are for. They force the air into your lungs, and they also have more oxygen in there so you can breathe. Um, why don't we end up with some problems? See if you can figure out what some of these problems are, okay? So we talked about breathing, talked about gas exchange, we talked about the dissociation curve. Let's take a look at some problems, see if you can figure out what the problem is, okay? So let's start off with a normal lung. So what's this? But what is that? Okay, what's this? Okay, we talked about emphysema. You lose what? You lose surface area. So we talked about that one already. What's the problem with something like fibrotic lung disease? What's the problem? So what? No, so the distance between what? The distance between where the oxygen is and where it has to go across that membrane has increased. The longer that, the bigger that distance is, the longer it takes for the oxygen to get in, the less oxygen you pick up. What's the problem with pulmonary edema? So if you get like an infection, like really bad influenza, your lungs could fill up with fluid. So the 1918 outbreak, this was the problem. Patients were accumulating fluid in their lungs, and they literally drowned. What's the problem? Why? Because look at the distance now. Look at where the oxygen is and look at how far it's got to travel to get into your... Remember, the idea is if it takes longer to get to your bloodstream, it will be worse for you. The longer it takes, the worse it is. And then I think someone mentioned asthma. Asthma, you can see the problem is the airways are constricted. So there's less air. Less air means less what? Oxygen getting into your bloodstream. So why don't we... Opens it up. But how? Steroids. Yeah. Wait, sir. Yes. How come some people have certain types? Yeah. It depends on your condition. 
Not everyone's condition is going to be exactly the same. Why don't we stop there? And I'm going to put up a question on the board, okay? So let's stop there.